Welcome to this fifth talk in our Ignatian retreat in daily life. And so today, let's go back to that question, what is the purpose of this retreat? Ignatius says that the name of spiritual exercises is given to any means of preparing and disposing our soul to rid itself of all its disordered affections, and then after their removal of seeking and finding God's will in the ordering of our life for the salvation of our soul. Now we've spent the last two days reflecting and praying about our disordered affections, about our attachments, our sinfulness, anything that holds us back from fulfilling the will of God. And today our theme is seeking God's will, hearing the call of God. Now the thing is God's will is the place we started this retreat. We thought first about who God is and then we thought about why human beings are created. So in a sense we know what God's will is for us. It's a general will. We know it's broad lines. We are all without exception called to praise, reverence and serve God. And we are called to salvation. That is our calling, all of us. But at the same time, there is also a specific will of God, a particular will for us, just for us. The will for which we were personally created as individuals with our own character and our context and our circumstances and our gifts and our limitations. Just as our own disordered attachments are specific to us, and we see this from the Gospels. Jesus' challenge to people is different. He knows their hearts. It fascinates me always that Jesus didn't ask Zacchaeus, the corrupt tax official, to give away everything he had. He simply invited himself to his house. Whereas the rich young ruler, the pious young man, he was the one Jesus asked to sell everything he had and give it to the poor. Jesus' responses to people are very personal and his call is very personal. The will of God, as well as being general, is also specific to each of us. Ron Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, describes vocation simply as becoming who you are. Becoming who you are. And God knows we are all very different. And God knows that better than we know ourselves. Oh God, you search me. And you know me. So within that will of God, are there particular ways of being, particular states of life, which are better or worse than any other? Well, the church has had debates about this through the whole of its existence. But Ignatius is fundamentally clear that God can be found in all things. So the question Ignatius invites us to ask now is simply this one. In which life or state does his divine majesty wish us to serve him? On the basis that God can be found in all things, but that there are some things which for us personally are better for God's greater glory. So what's the better thing for us, for God's greater glory? So we have a huge field of choice. In principle, there are many options open to us. And at the same time, choosing a particular path, seeking God's will and finding it and putting it into practice, requires a choice from us. It requires us to engage our liberty, the very same liberty which was diminished by our sinfulness, by our attachments, and is now being restored to us by God's grace and mercy. But engaging our liberty requires accepting the limits that this implies, accepting the choice that has been made. 
We are invited to move from a space where everything is possible and nothing has been chosen. So all the possibilities are, I guess, theoretical at that point because nothing's actually happened. We're invited to move from that space to another space where something has been chosen, which means that various other options are no longer open to us. They are closed. Our liberty, which has been restored, has now been engaged in a specific commitment. The seed has been planted in order to bear fruit for ourselves, for God, and for others. But the planting of that seed is a commitment. Unless it is planted, it will not grow. And as it grows, it will change. It is on a one-way journey. And so this is why people often do Ignatian retreats, specifically when they are deciding whether to get married or become consecrated celibates or follow a path into a specific ministry role or hear God calling them to a new stage of life perhaps in retirement or at the end of their studies or another state of life which requires a permanent commitment an either or commitment and there's another thing to bear in mind which is that because of who God is and because of who we are Hearing the will of God, the call of God, is a process which is both exterior to us and interior. Jesus is the divine majesty, the king who calls, worthy of our obedience and our reverence. And at the same time, the Holy Spirit is our most intimate companion, whispering the will of God in our heart, meeting us in our deepest desires. So what this means is that we will hear the call of God in two ways, from outside, revealing perhaps something new, but also from inside, revealing something that was already there, but was hidden from us. Maybe something we were unaware of, a deeper desire. What this means is that when we hear the will of God, there's very often a surprise, a shock, just as the revelation of our sin is a shock, it's a revelation, it's something we could not have worked out by ourselves. So the revelation of our calling of the will of God for us personally is a shock. Think of Mary and her response, confusion, fear, overwhelm. So how do we position ourselves? How do we dispose ourselves to receive what God will be revealing to us today. Well, a reminder to you that this retreat is just a taster. It's an introduction to the introduction to the exercises. If you want to go further with this, you would need to find a space where you could go further with the Ignatian exercises. But for today, we're going to look back at this introduction, which we've been dwelling on, the first principle and foundation. Let's go back and read the next paragraph, which introduces one of Ignatius's key tools for seeking and finding the will of God. It's a concept, the concept of indifference. Now, this word indifference can be very misleading, just like the word sin. In its popular use, we need to go back and realize what it means in its technical sense. So, here's the traditional version of the first principle and foundation. Ignatius says, it is necessary to make ourselves indifferent to all created things as much as we are able, so that we do not necessarily want health rather than sickness, riches rather than poverty, honor rather than dishonor, a long rather than a short life, and so in all the rest, so that we ultimately desire and choose only what is most conducive for us to the end for which God created us. I'll read that last bit again. So that we ultimately desire and choose only what is most conducive for us to the end for which God created us. Now let's hear the contemporary version we've also been using, which sheds a bit of light on what this might mean for us. 
We must hold ourselves in balance before all of these created gifts, insofar as we have a choice and are not bound by some obligation. We should not fix our desires on health or sickness, wealth or poverty, success or failure, a long life or a short one, for everything has the potential of calling forth in us a deeper response to our life in God. So I hope that helps. And just a brief ecumenical aside at this point. When I first discovered John Wesley's covenant service, a service which is at the heart of the Methodist tradition, and here at Holy Cross we work in cooperative partnership with St. Margaret's Uniting Church, and the Uniting Church in Australia is a church which is rooted in both the Presbyterian tradition, which we've already spoken about, the teachings of John Calvin, and the Methodist tradition, the teachings of the Wesleys. And the covenant service is the service where Methodists gather every year to make precisely this step, to become indifferent before God, to ask in what way they can serve God. Open to these different choices, but seeking above all how God will lead us in them. And for those of us from churches that have grown out of this Anglican tradition, Wesley, of course, was initially an Anglican. He lived and died in Anglican, as it happened. But I think maybe John Wesley is actually our Ignatius, and we can pay attention to him. But that's an aside, as I said. So we have our key concept for the day, which is that of indifference, in this sense of balance. Indifference not for its own sake, and indifference not as the absence of desire, but indifference as a vital stage in a process of choosing. A space of freedom, freedom from our own disordered attachments, freedom from our superficial desires. Maybe they are good things that we want, but maybe there is a better thing. And maybe to choose the better thing, we need to set aside some of these more superficial desires. And of course we need to be freed from those desires which are misdirected, disordered, which will do us no good. So a place of balance, of freedom, where we can hear more clearly the voice of Jesus. Hear something new, something revelatory, which reveals for us both our own deeper desires, which will always, I think, be coherent with what God has already shown us, and at the same time they can feel very disruptive. So we need to dwell with them, to taste them, to journey with them, to allow Jesus to lead us on this new journey as we choose above all to follow him and discover as we go on our pilgrimage what is this will of God for us personally so that we may both come to desire it and to choose it. So our biblical meditation for today is from the Gospel of Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. I'll read that for us now. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Jesus got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When Jesus had finished speaking to everyone, Jesus said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night long, but we have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they'd done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For Peter and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. 
Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. So you begin by choosing your place. This place will be familiar to you now. You choose your time. And again, as we draw into this retreat, you might choose a little bit longer time if you find that helpful. And remember to stay with the time you've chosen. And you read the text, we've just read it now. The next step, which is of course the most important, is to come into the presence of God, to turn to Jesus personally. Make the sign of the cross if that helps you. I'd encourage you to try it if you've never done it. And then to ask for a grace. And Ignatius suggests today the grace that you should ask is to be not deaf to God's call, but prompt and diligent to hear it and to follow. To be not deaf to God's call, but prompt and diligent to hear it and to follow. And then you imagine the scene. And to do this, I want you to use the first three verses. This is Jesus preaching the word of God to people generally. And we have the boats, we have the lake, we have the nets, we have the fishermen, the crowd. Imagine that scene. What's the smell of the sea? What's the wind like today? Which lake is this? We're here in Canberra. Is it Lake Burley Griffin? You imagine today... Choose the scene which speaks to you, where you can imagine most creatively what is happening. And then the three points you're invited to meditate on today are the exchanges between Jesus and Peter. So the first point is Jesus' first word to Peter. This is not a general teaching. This is not the Sermon on the Mount. This is a personal word. Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Jesus is inviting Peter to do something personal, something specific, something actually maybe rather odd. He's inviting Peter to trust him and Peter's initial response. We've caught nothing. We've tried this before. It did not work. Yet, if you say so, Master, I will let down the nets. So just dwell for 10 minutes on that exchange between Jesus and Peter and see how you feel. The second point, watch as Peter and the fishermen do as Jesus asked. They put out into the deep, they put out their nets. Maybe they'd started to put the nets away. We see they were washing them. And here they're going to get their hands and the nets dirty again. And what happens? They catch so many fish that the nets were beginning to break. They need their partners to handle the catch. And the boats begin to sink, to be overwhelmed with the abundance of what has happened. And Peter's response, what is Peter's response? It's to turn to Jesus and to say, Lord, go away from me, for I am a sinful man. His response is amazement. He has a gut realization of who this Jesus is. And in the light of this abundance of Jesus' gift, he realizes who he is. It's as if the boards of the boat give way and he begins to sink into the waves himself. And so he turns and looks to Jesus. From this place of vulnerability. So that's our second point. And then the third point is Jesus' final word to Peter. And the first thing Jesus does is to reassure him, do not be afraid. And then a new vocation. 
which is in continuity with everything Peter has ever done, but also is new and different and surprising. From now on, you will be catching people. And the response of Peter and his companions, they leave their boats on the shore, they leave everything. And they start walking after Jesus, who is walking away, and they follow. So finish, as always, after your three points, with a colloquy, speak to Jesus as a friend speaks to a friend. What do you want to say to him? Close with a closing prayer, another sign of the cross. And then take some time to take some notes. What do you want to remember from this time of prayer? So have a good time of prayer.